That's right, we're right here, Sharp Facets Gallery. Boy, do I have a treat for you. I am here with Connie Reagan Blake and uh, Prudence Taylor. Of course, you know Prudence Taylor is the head of the library system here in Greenwood and the surrounding area. Connie Reagan Blake is an extraordinary storyteller, and we're going to be talking to her this afternoon. I read a couple of the reviews of some festivals that you had been at, and I thought I couldn't think of anything better to introduce you with when it says, it's a summer night in Philadelphia, and 20,000 people are seated on quilts or blankets before a large outdoor stage. A hush falls over the crowd as Connie Reagan Blake steps up to the microphone and in a low, melodic voice says, I'd like to tell you a story and the audience is mesmerized. <laughs> That's quite an evening. <laughs> that was, that had to have been, yes. Yeah. So uh, very impressive, Connie. So uh, welcome to the show today. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. And what have you been doing here today? I understand you've been around at schools. What's been happening? I have, I've been to three of your high schools in the area telling stories, uh, Greenwood High and Emerald one is 96. 96, that's right. <laughs> An unusual see. name for me to, yeah. here. But the students were just terrific, too. You know, sometimes people are a little concerned, not so much at your Greenwood Public Library, because you all know the power of stories, but in some other communities, sometimes they're not real sure about bringing teenagers into your stories. And first program this morning, it was about 300 students. But um, if you tell the right stories, it really captures their imagination, and they were terrific audiences to do. Well, what kind of stories did you choose to tell? I tell all different kinds of stories. I love the traditional stories, so I told a couple of jack tales. You know, the Appalachian Mountains is really a, a rich hotbed for storytelling. A lot of the people that lived in England, Ireland, and Scotland, when they kind of found the Appalachians, mm -hmm. looked like home, and they brought their stories with them. So I told um, uh, a couple of those that I learned from my mentor, Ray Hicks, who was a master storyteller. I told about him. And then I tell some personal experience stories, some really funny things sometimes, and I told a couple of ghost stories. Well, it couldn't be more appropriate with uh, Halloween here. Maybe we'll get you to tell us one during the show. Maybe it's that a great would time be for it. It would be. But um, Connie, where are you originally from? I was born in Mobile, Alabama, and then spent some formative years up in Birmingham. And my mom's family was all very close. And two of the brothers um, and her mother and father moved down to a little community in Florida, Palatka, Florida. I know right where that is. You do. Yes. Well, they lived in East Palatka, Florida, okay. on the east side of the St. John's River. Mm -hmm. And my dad was working for the Internal Revenue Service, so mom said, See if you can't get a transfer. And the nearest big city was Jacksonville. Yep. So we moved down there, and I lived there through my high school years, and I still have family living there. I actually uh, lived in Ponte Vedra for several oh, years, yes. right outside of Jacksonville, uh -huh. right? And then we moved actually down to Leesburg, Florida, in the central part of the state. Yes, so. I know that too. Yeah, so, uh, but. Um, so as you were growing up, how, how did you see your life coming together? Well, I certainly never thought that I would make my living on stage. You know, I, I wasn't particularly shy, but I was not the one that was kind of regaling everyone at the table or in my classrooms with jokes and stories, and that was not really so much a part of who I was. I loved math. And my vision was that I would get my doctorate in mathematics and then go down to NASA, which mm -hmm. was in Florida, right. and um, help you know do all the calculations to put people into outer space. I went away to college. I went to Loyola in New Orleans. And went away to college with that in mind. And things shifted, as they sometimes do. Sure. I ended up getting a degree in political science which some people say is a good background for storytelling. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> but, um, we got a lot of politicians telling good stories, that's don't the we? Right. <laughs> that's the right. And I thought at that point that I might be a lawyer. Another good place to tell stories. stories. Yes. I actually work some with lawyers and courtrooms. You have to uh, spin the story, right? That's right. Exactly. You have to really 
be inside that story enough to where, especially if it's a trial uh, with jurors, mm -hmm. to where the jurors really believe that you believe what you're saying. Sure. So, but I uh, decided after I graduated from undergraduate school that I really wanted a break. And so I bought a one-way ticket to Europe, and I ended up living over there for about 14 or 15 months, mostly hitchhiking around. You know, we wouldn't even think of doing that today. I know. You know it's a different is, world. It is a different world, yeah. and I love it when I hear stories about just taking off and just doing this kind of stuff. I think our kids miss so much because they can't do this now. That's right. It was uh, an incredible sense of freedom, and a lot of people were kind of watching your back. Right. You know, so it, it was much safer hospitals. time. I did, and um, oftentimes people, I was traveling to begin with, with a woman I graduated from college with, and then she fell in love and uh, came back to the States to get married. And I had met other people by then, so I was usually traveling with other people. Mm -hmm. And I loved it, and I finally ran out of money. I had worked when I was in college at um, waitressing at resorts and things. And so I'd save money to go. My, I was one of those lucky ones. My parents paid for my college, so I had money saved. But once you ran out of money in Europe, you, know, you could live very cheaply. Right. Once you ran out, it was hard to make any money. Right. So I had enough to get a ticket to get back home. And I came back really with the intention of making a little money and heading back to Europe or Australia or around the world. What did you like so much about traveling back then? You know, I just loved meeting other people. I loved other cultures. I don't really have too much of an ear for different languages, but I love the fact of people speaking different languages. Mm -hmm. And then I just love seeing things, you know, seeing, I remember being in England and I was so taken with Stonehenge. You know, I went there and, and saw those huge rocks and heard the stories about how they got there, the, uh, you know, there are different opinions about sure. that, and uh, but it was a magical time, you know. It's just I love the ocean, I love the mountains. I saw we went through the Alps. By then, I'd gotten a little um, Volkswagen. We felt like we were practically pedaling, you know, <laughs> putting I had our foot out, out <laughs> trying to get up those Alps. And, but I love that beauty. I love different uh, scenery and different temperatures, different weather. And it's not the same as looking at it on the internet. And so many people think that you can see these things and experience those things on the internet. You can't. Boy, it's not the same at all. No. You know, walking through a street and meeting someone, and you know, them taking time and you taking time to be able to say hello, to be able to communicate without language, you find lots of other ways. Now, as I am a, a, a storyteller, I often travel to foreign countries. And I always take photographs of my home, my husband, my animals, my dog and, and uh, dogs and cat, my flower gardens. I take a map. And so with just that, you can really have a conversation. You can really connect with other people. So I would say probably that was the biggest thing that was driving me about traveling was connecting with and then you came back here to the States. That's right. To make a little back, money. Right. I, I went to, you had to come home to make some money, That's right? That's right. <laughs> and I, the only thing I'd done up till then was waitressing. You know, I, I'd actually traveled up to Colorado and waitressed out at a big resort there. So I went to Atlanta. My sister lived there. And I got a job at what was then the tallest building in Atlanta. And it was the Polaris Room. A restaurant that revolved well, around on the um, what was that Regency, on? I think the Regency Hyatt, one of the hotels. Yes, yes, could have changed hands. Of course, now that's a tiny little place, and there are lots of buildings right. higher. But at that time, it was the highest. And so I was kind of saving my money. And my first cousin in my mom's family, her brother's uh, daughter, she and I were always good friends growing up. And she was the children's librarian at the Chattanooga Public Library. And so I went up to visit her to catch up. And after we had told a few family stories and told each other how our lives were unfolding, she said, Connie, we have just written a grant. They have just gotten word, a federal grant, to take library service out to preschoolers in daycare centers. Now, daycare centers, Head Start was a brand new thing. Yep. This was 1971, <laughs> way back then. 
And Barbara said, uh, the, li the head librarian, and she had written the program, and they'd written in to hire a storyteller. They thought that would be the best way to connect these three, four, and five-year-olds right. with the library, sure. was to tell them stories. And she said, we're looking to hire a storyteller. I think you could do it. And I said, great. What is a storyteller? <laughs> so she sat me down, told me a few stories, and I something about it just resonated with me. And plus I thought, well, it good on my resume. It was only funded for nine months. I could have a for real job and kind of for real and make a little money and go back traveling. So I was went and applied for it and was hired. But probably within two to three weeks of doing that. I knew that somehow I would be telling stories the rest of my life. Never imagining I could make my living sure. doing it. But it it just, I loved it. I do a lot of workshops in storytelling. And I always tell people, as the storyteller, you have the best seat in the house. And having that coming at me, those children listening, the director of the library also sent me out to lots of adult groups so the Kiwanis Club and the Association of University Women, and she was wanting me to go out and talk about this program. I didn't realize it until later. She was doing that so that she would gain community support. Sure. And that program and I, two years ago, celebrated 40 years of oh. storytelling. The program is still going on. But because she sent me out to adult groups, I also got very comfortable telling to that age group, being comfortable in front of them as well as the children. And I was there for four years. And during that time, um, there were folk festivals around. Not many storytelling festivals. The very first national storytelling festival happened in Jonesboro, Tennessee, during the time I was at the library, and I went to that. But uh, I started telling stories on stages at festivals. And then in 1975, that same first cousin and I quit our library jobs, got a pickup truck with a camper, uh, what and did you call started it? out. Da Putt. Da Putt. <laughs> so this was before Nissan. It used to be called Dotson. Some right. people might remember that. And so Da Putt stood for Dotson Pickup Truck. <laughs> That's great. And uh, we put a lot of miles on that truck, traveling all over the East Coast. And I, and I, and I think I read that it was your dressing room, your dining room, it was your Our every house. <laughs> <It> was. <laughs> yes. We even had, uh, you know, we had the back set up to where we could sleep back there, and we each had our own side, and we had artwork hanging from the ceiling of the uh, little camper, and we had all of our little things that we carried with us. And we actually lived out of that truck for three years, from 1975 until 1978. That made you very space conscious, didn't it? It did. <laughs> you know, I didn't need much, either of us did. Exactly. And actually, as we traveled, there were so many kind, generous people who would invite us into their homes. You know, a, a librarian would hire us. Maybe she saw us on a main stage at a folk festival in New York. Right. And um, then she would hire us to come to her community in uh, Ohio, and then often they would put us up. But we always knew we could stay in that truck if we needed to. Well, what kind of stories <coughs> did, you, did, you, did you tell when you first started doing the stories? Well, in the early days, a lot of them were children's stories. Yeah. But we were used to telling them to adults. And we actually... Um, what are you saying here, honey? <laughs> You know, if you don't really say, sometimes I do family performances, and I'll say, now I'm going to tell some stories that are more for kids, some that are more for adults, but I'm not going to tell you which is which. You know? So, um, but actually I'll tell you about an experience. Uh, we had uh, been as campers, we had tickets to a festival in Albany, New York, upstate New York. Okay. It's a big festival, probably about six or seven thousand people, and we were just had our little ticket. You know, we were going to attend, and we had our camper. And this was within two weeks of selling everything that we owned and starting out to travel. And our thought had been, you know, maybe we could waitress. Both of us knew how to do that, or we could pick grapes, or 
And this was in 1975, and the um, uh, bicentennial was coming up. Mm -hmm. So we stopped at a library in New Jersey and Xeroxed a couple of Paul Revere stories and thought, well, maybe we could do this in a mall somewhere or something. And, but we went on up to upstate New York. We already had our tickets. And we camped at the Little Hoosig River Campground at 4 o'clock the first night that we were there, 4 o'clock in the morning, Someone came and banged on the window of our camper and said, the little Hoosick River is rising. You have to get out. <laughs> so we left. and it The river itself the was river rising. rising. It had been raining a lot. And it was going to flood. And so they sent us over to where the festival was on a lot of acreage. It was a big farm. And they let us camp where the performers were camping. Very first day, we went to lots of different. We heard ballad singers and saw clog dancers and singer songwriters. And then that night, as we had met people during the day, we said, We're going to be telling some stories around the campfire tonight. So we had a lot of people come, a lot of them that were performers mm -hmm. and others that ran festivals. And we told stories. So before we left for that weekend, we had a job the following week. And we went was to that. Was that planned or was that just No, no, stage? they just heard us around the campfire and said, there's a festival in Connecticut next week. Why don't you come? Actually, it wasn't a, a real job. Uh, the person said, um, I'm going to be performing, and if I've got a little time, I'll put you on stage. And that's exactly what he did. We told a story. There was someone in the audience at that Hartford Festival that uh, ran a day care um, a little school. Mm -hmm. She invited us to come the next morning and said, I'll pay you $25. That was our first job. And But I remember when we were unloading some things, we got hired to do a coffee house performance that same uh, week, and someone had heard us. And so we were unloading things out of the car, and some kids kind of out of the truck, back of the truck, and some kids gathered around, and they saw we had where the wild things are, Maurice Sendo. Right. And they saw that book and one of them asked us to tell it. Well, at the library, both of us had told that independently without the book, so we knew the story. But in that moment, in that Connecticut parking lot, Barbara started off and said she was my cousin. She started off by saying, the night Max wore his wolf suit, and I chimed in with, and made mischief of one kind, and both of us said, and another. His mother called him wild thing, and Max said, I'll eat you up. So he was sent to bed without eating anything. That was our very first tandem story. We swapped lines all the way through that story, said some words together, and that became a signature style of our story. Well, how did that make you feel when that just, because that just happened. You hadn't practiced this or anything Right, else. it's just, well, you know, uh, we ended up then telling a lot of these tandem stories. And our voices really blended together. And sometimes people would say, oh, you almost have to practice so much. But it wasn't. It was more like, you know how family members sometimes can sing harmony mm -hmm. and their voices just click right in? It was like that for us. We also had a we're very close friends. We had a similar pace and rhythm. Even though we were very different kinds of people, it came easy for us. And so we went on. We continued telling some of the children's stories from main stage of some of these major folk festivals. And we actually told uh, that Where the Wild Things Are, we had another huge audience at the Winnipeg Folk Festival up in Canada. And we had everyone stand up and put on their wolf suits and get ready for this story. And then we also, I had learned some other stories that were really meant more for adults. I was always drawn to the scary stories, the ones that sent a little chill down your spine. And adults loved those. And then we continued learning other kinds of stories, mostly traditional stories, you know, those that have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years without an author, the ones that I feel are just inside us as humans. And then we also told some other stories from books. 
And by putting that book down, you could really tell it to a much wider age range. Whereas if you pick the book up and told it, they might think, oh, that's only for first and second readers. But by sure. putting that book down, it gives it a different energy. You know, uh, one of the movies that I really enjoy was uh, Thunderdome, Mad Max and the Thunderdome. And because I, the reason I like that movie is because there's a part in the movie where they don't have books, they don't have anything, but it's the tell. And they talk about the tell, and they pass down the stories from generation to generation yes. by telling the stories. That's right. And it, it's just a beautiful part of that movie. I mean, most of it's pretty crazy, but at that moment, you know, they tell the stories, and it's just so important that everybody sit down and pay attention and learn the story of their history. You know, that's really in all cultures. We, we human beings, I think, have always told stories and listened to stories. And I often will mention to an audience that I feel like we're in this lineage. You know, if it goes back not just a couple hundred years, but thousands of years. Sometimes, thousands of years ago, people were listening to some of the same stories that we're telling today. And sometimes people will say, oh, well, didn't storytelling die, or you stopped bringing it back? And But I really feel like it's more that it's just gone dormant. You know, it's um, it could never die, because it's too much a part of who we are as people. Well, you know, what I think is that part of the problem is that we've gotten so technologically advanced, we don't take time to turn off the phones, turn off these uh, uh, devices, mm -hmm. And we don't talk. And when we talk, we do tell stories. And that's I right. think that's part of the problem with society today, is we don't spend that time talking and telling stories. That's right. I think so, too. I do acknowledge, though, I mean, there, there are, the technology can be a great way to hear stories. You know, we recently had uh, the second annual online storytelling festival. And it was during three days, it was videos of the storytellers, but each person was scheduled at a particular time. And during that time, all of it was on Facebook, during that time, up to 50,000 people across the world were listening at the same time. And then they could communicate through Facebook with that storyteller live. So I think there's some potential there, but I think also you're absolutely right that that can be so isolating that we don't take time to either listen or to tell. Well, it, yes, and I think that, that would be a, it would be hard to do it on Facebook, particularly from the standpoint of, don't you as a storyteller get your, I'll say, your juice from the audience? Yes, from the listeners. There. Of course, over the radio we can do it. Yeah, well. so yes, exactly. You know, and so you're imagining those people listening. Right. You kind of feel their energy in that way. Exactly. But the best is right there in person so that it's unfolding. I like to say that um, it's as if sometimes when I go on stage, I usually have an idea of what I'm going to tell, but I'm always open. One of the ways that I say it, the image I have, is that sometimes a story comes and taps me on the shoulder wanting to be told. And I feel that really comes from the audience. It's whatever they're bringing there, and I'm open for that. And I've had some really extraordinary experiences in traveling that has really reinforced that in different performances, things that have happened where an audience member has said, you told that story just for me. And it might have been a story I wasn't even thinking about or even considering when I went on stage. So it's very much connection. Uh, connection. Mm -hmm. yeah kind of reminds me of the, the show Cold Cases. I've heard of that, but I've not <laughs> seen it. So. Where, you know, they have cold cases and the gal goes in and she finds out the past of, of what really happened in a, in a legal matter. Yes. Where somebody was killed or something like that. And, uh, you know, then the person actually, they show it as a ghost coming back to life and then everybody goes off once the case is solved and people can rest in peace. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that was the premise. Yeah, very, very cool. cool. Very cool. Hey, I'm Ann Eller. I'm here with Connie Reagan Blake and a very silent Prudence Taylor today. <laughs> kind of unusual for Prudence. We'll be right back. Don't you go away. Um, are you a pirate or a pack rat? Do you have a vacation of a lifetime sitting in the attic? 
or a college tuition hung on a wall, or is a fabulous retirement hidden in your jewelry box. Bring those items to Sharp Facets Gallery. We can establish value and buy from you or sell for you. And so ends another chapter at Sharp Facets Gallery. 72 Bypass and on the web, sharpfacets.com. Oh, that's right. We're right back here, Sharp Facets Gallery. I'm Ann Eller here with Connie Reagan Blake. We're talking about the, the development of a storyteller, I guess we should call it. Uh, phenomenal, uh, phenomenal what we're talking about here today. If you're just joining us, I certainly hope you know you can go back and hear the podcast, and there'll be a video on the web, too. So uh, this is what we're talking about. I want to talk about your trip to Uganda. I uh, saw your video on, on uh, YouTube, and to me it is phenomenal, but, I, you know, and I know that uh, Charles was a doctor, an uh, AIDS doctor, and his wife, what was her name? Torkin. Torkin. An unusual name. Yes. <laughs> what background is she? You know, I don't know actually where she got that name, but I've known them for a long time. I met them back in the 70s, and I kept in touch, and then Charles was invited to come over to... Uh, Uganda to work with other doctors all over Africa on AIDS and how to treat AIDS patients and that kind of thing. Well, you know, I saw I, 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 I watched the video, like I said, and, and the fact that you went over there to hear the stories of women over there in Uganda, and what was that experience like? Boy, and it was really, uh, you know, we, we use that phrase life-changing and maybe that gets to be where it doesn't even have much meaning to it. But one of the images, <clears throat> the ways that I think about it, it's as if there is a large arc, and I'm still kind of growing into that arc from that experience. It gave me a whole different vision of poverty, of being present, about what true joy is. It kind of shook up everything for me. It was a very powerful experience that I think will, I know, will stay with me the rest of my life. Well, tell us about the Beats for Life, and uh, tell us about the one character, Rose, not character, woman, Rose, who right. was uh, very destitute and had children and just <coughs> didn't know how she was really going to survive. Yes, it was a very rough life. It is a rough life for a lot of people here. You know, we hear that too sometimes, living on a dollar a day or less. And then sometimes I think we can think, well, probably everything costs less. It doesn't. I mean, it's, it's true extreme poverty. And um, my friend Torkin went with her husband, Charles, and she went with this wonderful attitude of how can I be of service. And she ended up starting this nonprofit with two other friends, Devin and Jenny. The three of them started a nonprofit called Bead for Life. And uh, uh, kind of the tagline is eradicating poverty one bead at a time. And Torkin had been walking through with her friends through a, uh, a, a it was actually a quarry where people were, their main job there was to pick up rocks, had a little hammer, and they would ping, 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 break up that rock, hammering their hands put it over into a pile and pick up another rock and hammer it all day long from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 at night. No shelter from that hot equator sun and they would make less than a dollar for doing that. And it's because they didn't have any equipment or machinery for making gravel. So at this place the Acholi people gather, there are about 7,000 people that live at this slum. So Torkin was walking through an area there in Kampala in Uganda, and she saw a woman, she later found out her name is Millie Grace, who was making jewelry. And she had this big pile of beads. And Torkin and her friends stopped to watch, and so they watched her cut out these long strips of recycled paper from posters, political posters, or magazines. Then she was rolling that little triangle up very tightly, putting a little drop of glue at the end and then putting that bead over into this basket. Once she had a huge pile of them, she strung them up and then she would dip them in shellac, hang them up on a line to dry. Two weeks later she came back and 
dipped again and hung them up to dry and a third time. And once she had done that, then she made jewelry. Well, Torkin was really taken with the jewelry. It was so beautiful and colorful. And she loved the idea that it was handmade like that. So she bought four of the necklaces. And the next morning, she was going to meet with the director of an orphanage. So she put on one of the necklaces. When she got into the meeting, the director of the orphanage admired the necklace. So Torkin took it off and gave it to her. And the next day, she was going to meet her husband, Charles, for lunch, wore another necklace. Yeah. A secretary saw it and said, oh, I love that necklace. So she took it off and gave it to her. And when this happened the third time, you know, Torkin and her two friends, Devin and Jenny, realized, we've got something here. There's a demand for this. It's a way, maybe, that these women, if we can help connect them to some market, they had no idea what they might do. None of them had a business background. But they came back to the States after three or four months, brought a hundred of the necklaces with them, and everyone just went wild with them. So they just kind of were inspired to start this nonprofit. And the way that the jewelry gets out to people is either online at the website, it's a beadforlife.org, or mostly women all over North America give what they call bead parties. Bead so parties. instead of the old Tupperware parties, right. they make it very easy. You sign up, and if you have a church group or maybe your staff at where you work might enjoy looking at it at lunchtime or something, and they um, tell you just how to do it. They send you a box with this beautiful jewelry with recipes for African appetizers if you want to go that route. Okay. And they send you a, a CD with some African music to play. from the women, right. a DVD that tells about Beat for Life, and all this beautiful fair trade jewelry. And everything's between $5 and $30. And so last two years ago, 1,800 people in North America gave bead parties. Wow. So it's having a huge impact. Absolutely. But back when it was just starting, um, Torkin wanted me to come over and listen to the stories of some of the women that were coming out of this Acholi quarter, out of the place where they had been hammering their hands and learning how to make beads and beautiful jewelry. And so the very first morning that I was there, after traveling 42 hours, I flew from Asheville, North Carolina, to Charlotte, to Frankfurt, Germany, to Dubai, to Nairobi, oh to Entebbe, there in Uganda. And uh, I got had off to be the pooped. plane. Oh, it was quite an... Actually, I was very energized. I um, got off the plane and the air, it felt tropical, and I saw some orchids blooming, and some bougainvillea, a little yellow bird flew by me. That's and the same I thing you said in that story. Yes, <laughs> that's right. I thought I was in paradise. <laughs> but my very first morning there, I was sitting um, uh, at the, on a porch at the office of Beat for Life, and I was to interview Nama Casa Rose. That was to be my first person I was going to meet. And Torkin had told me about Rose, how she had a very tough life. Her husband had died, and she had four little children. No food, no way to make a living. There are so many poor people in that country and probably in a lot of countries around the world, as well as here in the United States. And um, so I was sitting there waiting, and, and Namakaza Rose came through a little door and a big steel door, and boy, I could hardly believe it was the same woman. You know, she was, as my mom would say, dressed to the nines. She had on red and gold shoes. And, matching red and gold outfit, and, and uh, she told me a story right away. She knew I was a storyteller. She told me a traditional story, and she did a great job of it, too. She just became those characters, and I told her, I said, Rose, when she finished, I said, you could have been telling that story on main stage at any storytelling festival in America. And that seemed to really please her. And she told me that hers was a very happy family. But I knew that she had lived a very rough life. And I asked her about some of those hard times. And she said that almost always they didn't have food. She'd send the children out to dustbins, to garbage dumps, to 
to see if she could find, they could find any leftover food somewhere that had been thrown out. But that wasn't the usual case over No, there, right. there was almost nothing thrown right. out. And she said, she told me that once she had found a coin on the ground walking along. And after that, she made it her job every morning. She would get up early, four or five o'clock in the morning, leave those four children asleep, young children, and she would go out and walk the dirt paths, always with her head down, looking for a coin. She usually went to bars, thinking maybe someone a little tipsy might have dropped something. And if she found a coin, it meant that day she could go to the market, maybe get two tablespoons of oil put into a little plastic bag, a cup or two of cornmeal, and if the children could find a piece of used charcoal, that meant they could eat that day. And she said most days, though, she wouldn't find a coin. And during this time, she had a lot of sores. She was very sick, sores on her back and legs. But every day, she made herself get up. And she said often the children would cry themselves to sleep at night. They were so hungry. And she said that was the one bit of relief time she got was when they were asleep and not crying or not begging for food. And she said she thought it had been a mistake to have those children and that she wanted to put them back inside her. And she even commit, considered killing all of the children and killing herself to get them out of this misery. Absolutely. And then one day she heard that they were doing tests for a disease. They were testing for AIDS. And if you went in and got tested, you could get food for one day. And so she went in, that's when she met Dr. Charles. Right. And she found out that she had full-blown AIDS. And you know, I think about that, and I think probably maybe even every single person listening to this story right now would say, if that happened to them, I know if it happened to me, it might be the worst day of my life. Mm -hmm. But for Rose, it was a day that things started changing. Dr. Charles, sent her home with medicine, with some food so she could take the medicine, and also with a clock to know when to take the medicine. And before long, she started feeling better. And also before long, she met Torkin. Torkin went to visit her, taught her how to roll the beads. Rose found that she could do that as she was lying in bed, getting better. And she was getting better. She realized what a lot of people can realize, that once they have the right medicine, and enough food to be able to take the medicine, they can live very full lives with AIDS. And so before long, she was doing quite well and uh, rolling the beads. She learned how to make the jewelry. Every two weeks, she would go and uh, sell the jewelry. She was learning other skills. She was having this health care. Most of the people involved in Be For Life um, uh, have AIDS. The majority of them do. And Rose, she told me, she said, now my children are in school. You know, we don't think about that here in the United States, but in many places around the world, and certainly in Uganda, you have to pay to be able to send your children to school. Not only the tuition, you have to afford, be able to uniforms. afford uniforms mm -hmm. and food, a lunch. You have to be able to afford that, and so many people cannot. And so now all of her children are in school, and she told me, she said, Connie, if you come to visit me, you might say, oh, Rose, I can only visit for five minutes. She said, you will get surprised. It will be like your foot will be nailed to the floor, and five hours later, you'll still be there. She said, mine is a happy home. Isn't that and tremendous? It is. She told me that Be For Life has brushed the dust from her heart. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I thought that was great. And she also gave you a statue, didn't she? That's right. A little tiny, about seven or eight inches tall, a raffia doll. Mm -hmm. It's holding a basket, handmade. And she said, Connie, I used to be like this, all squinched up. But now I'm like this. And she opened her arms. You could just see her face beaming. She said, my basket is full. And that from somebody who had AIDS. That's right. Amazing story. Yeah, Amazing story. And I heard story. story after story from other women as well. Just stories where it was so hard to even listen to. But there's this sense of joy and peace 
of where they are now. And we seem to forget that, don't we? Sometimes. In our country, in our country, we forget that. We get so wrapped up with all our other things that we forget about the simple things of just being able to have food and a happy family. That's right. I think we get so involved, I know I do, I can get so involved in my stuff, you know, getting my stuff, protecting my stuff, buying more stuff, and storing my stuff, and, and our lives get really complicated around yep. all of that stuff. So, and we sometimes miss a lot. So do you remember back to that time where you, you were traveling in your camper? <laughs> and yes. you think about how little actual stuff you had. That's and exactly how, right. Exactly. And uh, about three months into traveling, our little camper got broken into. And the little bit of stuff we had got <laughs> stolen. <laughs> and then we found we still had our stories. That's right. Something you can always carry forward. That's right. I tell you what, we're going to hear a quick word from our, our sponsors when we come back. I think a Halloween story, a ghost story, might be in order from an extraordinary storyteller. Connie Reagan Blake is with us here today. Don't you go away. All right. We're right back here. Sharp Facets Gallery having an amazing conversation this afternoon with Connie Reagan Blake. Now, uh, Connie, you also have a website. If somebody wants to go, they can order some of these stories on That's CD right. I have CDs and a DVD. And the website is storywindow.com. And there's some links to hear some parts of stories and that kind of thing. So uh, you, you probably want to check that out. And she does live in Asheville, not very far away. So it must be nice to be up on the mountain and come down. I love it there. And it's I love traveling, and I do a lot of that. But it's also great to come back home, and that's a beautiful spot. It is a beautiful spot. Well, what story are you going to tell us here? I thought I might tell you one, a ghost story, since it's that Ooh. time of the year. And this is told as true. Outside of Owensboro, Kentucky, right along the Ohio River, there was a man named Dan Wheelman. He was down on his luck, hard times, didn't have almost any money. And he was trying to make his way back to West Virginia. And he was hitchhiking. This particular day, mostly he was walking. He hadn't had almost any rides, not even cars passing by. He was discouraged. He was hungry. He'd been in a rural part of the area. It was a two-lane road. Hadn't passed any houses and it seemed like hours. He was walking along the side of the road. And over across the road, there was a steep bank right down into the Ohio River. Well, the sun went down and it started getting dark. He was just feeling terrible. And then it started to rain. And he thought, oh, if only a car would come by. And then he noticed, coming up behind him, he saw two headlights. And he just said, oh, please, please let him stop for me. He could tell that car was moving pretty slowly. It was raining harder by then. And the car got up right beside him, and he didn't even wait to see if the guy would give him a lift. He just opened that door on the rider's side, jumped in the front seat, he closed that door, and he turned to thank the driver, and there was nobody driving that car. And then that car started moving slowly forward. There was no sound of an engine. Dan Whelan was petrified. He didn't know what to do. He was so scared, his heart was beating so fast, and that car just kept slowly inching forward. But then he could see in the headlights that there's a big curve coming up. It's curving around to the right. Dan thought, this car is going to keep going straight. It's going to go right across the road, down that bank, into the Ohio River. I'm going to drown. He was too frightened to do anything about it. He said another prayer, and just as they got to that curve, a shadowy figure appeared at the driver's window. A hand came in and wrapped hold of that steering wheel and guided that car right around that curve. And that hand went back out the window, and that figure disappeared. The man could hardly believe it. This happened three or four more curves, three or four more times. That hand would appear that shadowy figure, and then disappeared. Well, finally, Dan just thought, this is too much. I, I can't take it anymore. 
So he decided to jump out. He, he pushed that car door open. He jumped. He rolled a few times. And he got up on his feet, and he just took off running, running as fast as he could. And he came into the little town of Owensboro. Everything was shut down except for a bar he could see the lights on. He thought to himself, what I need is a drink. So he went over there. He ordered a double whiskey. And he took that. And, ah, he swallowed it right down. And you know how it is. If something out of the ordinary happens to you, you want to tell somebody. And that's just what Dan did. He started telling the bartender what had just happened. Now, there were several people sitting at the bar. They were listening to you. By the time he finished, you know, they felt like he'd had a drink, but he wasn't drunk. And he, they really believed him. Everything got quiet in the bar. Everybody kind of thinking about what they would have done in a similar circumstance. It was about a half an hour later. The door opened to the bar, and two guys walked in. And one of them pointed over at Dan Wheeler. And then he went back to his buddy and he said, Hey, Billy Joe, look, there's the idiot that was riding in the front seat while we were pushing our car in the rain. <laughs> That's Dan what a good really. Good story. Bravo, bravo. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. We're going to hold over here for just a second. What a great story. Yeah. Now, most of my ghost stories don't end like that. But that's kind of a fun short. It's got a twist to it. Yeah. yeah, that's great. So if people want to hear more of your stories, what do they need to do? Well, they can do a couple of things. Uh, they can go to my website and look at my calendar and see when I'm going to be performing, maybe if I'm performing in their area. Here it's only for schools, but maybe I'll come back to the community another time and tell for the general public. Or they could go online at that same website, storywindow.com, and purchase some CDs, different stories. Some are more for kids, some are more for adults, and there's one that's all ghost stories. Ooh. Or they can uh, Google me and maybe find that same story that you were talking about. That's called Hope is Back on Me. Right. And within the next three months, you're going to be able to uh, uh, see a lot of different stories and hear different stories online as well. Absolutely. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit down and talk to an extremely successful storyteller, one who had a twist and turn in her life. Never would have thought that's what you would have ended up doing, but that's what makes it so neat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. I feel very fortunate to be doing what I love. Absolutely. Well, Connie Reagan Blake, thanks so much for coming here. We'll make sure you get the uh, the uh, link to uh, our interview here today, and we'll also be posting a video on YouTube of today. Sounds good. Thank All you right. very much. Thoroughly enjoyed it, Anne. Thank you very much for coming out here today. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for us. This is WCRS right here in Greenwood. Bye-bye, everybody. I'll be back at 8 tomorrow morning. Come back. Listen. Bye-bye. <laughs>